I'm always on the lookout for interesting older laptops, either because they're weird or because they might still offer some usability despite their age. This time, we'll look at a computer that kind of fits into both categories, yet represents a missed opportunity. I'm a fan of the ThinkPad line of laptops, so when an X100e crossed my path, I knew I had to check it out. The model debuted in early 2010, and while some reviews referred to it as a sub-notebook, it's really more of a netbook, for reasons we'll get to in a moment. Like most smaller laptops, the X100e has a limited selection of ports. The left side has two USB 2.0, Ethernet, and headset jacks, while the right side only has an SD card reader and another USB 2.0 port. The back side is even more sparse, with just the power adapter input and a VGA output. Opening the screen reveals an 11.6 inch LCD with a resolution of 1366 by 768, which was decently high res for its size. And while the bezels are quite big by today's standards, the top one at least includes a webcam. This machine was pretty dirty, so I took the opportunity to clean it up. Unlike some other ThinkPads, this one doesn't feature a grippy, rubber-like coating. Instead, it's smooth plastic, which not only makes it easier to clean, but also avoids how that soft-touch coating tends to get sticky over time. I wanted to perform a couple of hardware upgrades right up front, so I removed the battery. It appears to be the original, a 6-cell pack rated for 57 watt-hours. The X100e comes apart like many other ThinkPads from its time, which is to say, rather easily. Just a few screws hold the bottom panel on, and they're all captive, so it's hard to lose them. Then the panel just unsnaps. I was surprised to see an empty slot next to the Wi-Fi card. This is for the optional cell modem, and includes a place for a SIM card. No doubt this would have been useful for those who were frequent business travelers. On the right side are a pair of RAM slots, and they were filled with 2GB DDR2 modules. 4 gigs was the official stated maximum for this model, but as is often the case, it turns out the system could handle more. I pulled them out and dropped in a pair of 4GB sticks for a total of 8 gigs. The other upgrade I wanted to tackle was the storage. This machine's 250 gig, 5400 RPM mechanical drive wasn't the best performer even when new, and I had a spare 128 gig SSD to swap in its place. I'm bothering with these upgrades because I'm curious if an X100e could be usable for modern tasks and want to give it the best shot at doing so. It's kind of surprising how well some older hardware can run Windows 10, so let's start with that. It's the 64-bit version, of course, to take advantage of all that RAM, which did get recognized correctly in the machine's BIOS. But being limited to USB 2.0 speeds meant it took a while to boot from the flash drive, and even longer to perform the actual install. But it seemed to be working fine. Until it got to the setup screen. I kept getting errors at the steps where you'd set up a Wi-Fi connection, or choose a language, or keyboard layout. I could usually skip past these, but the last one didn't give me that option. Apparently, I'm not the only one to have this problem, as I was able to find a guide online to set up a user account through the command line and finish the setup wizard. After another reboot and some more waiting, I finally made it to the Windows desktop. Almost all the necessary drivers were already installed, but any missing or outdated ones were taken care of through Windows Update. But that took forever, and there's a good reason why. The CPU in this thing is a major bottleneck. It features an AMD Athlon Neo running at 1.6 GHz, and it has a single core with a single thread. The CPU was screaming along at 100% pretty much all the time, and all the RAM and fast storage in the world couldn't help that. So while it technically works, I think Windows 10 is a bit too demanding for this hardware. Rendering web pages was agonizingly slow, at least when it would actually work.
sometimes the browser would just hang instead. Even opening the start menu had a noticeable lag. There's got to be a modern OS that's a better fit for this machine. Everyone always says to install Linux on hardware like this, so let's do just that. Based on some research, it seemed like Linux Mint with the XFCE UI could be a good fit, so I got it installed. The process went a bit quicker than with Windows, and thankfully I didn't encounter any errors, so things were already looking better. The user experience was certainly more tolerable, though still not as snappy as one would be led to believe. Web pages did load quicker, but there's still the impression that you're using a computer that's just not quite meant to be used this way. There is one practical use case for this setup, though, that plays to its strengths, or rather, weaknesses. Some people want distraction-free writing experiences, and the keyboard in the X100e absolutely delivers. Despite being netbook-sized, the machine packs a surprisingly comfortable keyboard that's right in line with its other ThinkPad counterparts. Solid, somewhat clicky, and decent key travel. The computer's fast enough to run a word processor without issue, but it's slow enough to discourage any stray web browsing. It seems like using this machine for modern purposes may have a pretty limited audience then, but what about retro? The hardware itself may not quite be what most people consider vintage, but perhaps it could be good for older games. To test that theory, I hooked up a USB optical drive and booted the Windows XP installer. At first, it didn't want to detect the hard drive, but then I realized I simply had forgotten to set the SATA controller to compatibility mode in the BIOS. After that, installing XP went smoothly and actually rather quickly. Of course, being a 32-bit OS, I wasn't able to make effective use of that 8GB RAM upgrade, so I'll probably return the machine to the 4 gigs it shipped with later on. I got all the drivers installed, then decided to try benchmarking this thing using 3 d Marco 3 Except I didn't get very far. It threw an error when I launched it and refused to run. That's not a good sign, but there's always my old standby, Quake 3 Arena. Not only is it a great game, but it's a pretty decent test of actual performance for titles from around the turn of the millennium. I cranked up all the graphics settings, then kicked off a benchmark run. It went by quicker than I expected, and I was blown away by the results. 142 frames per second. That's surprisingly good for a machine that competed with netbooks, and it comes down to its GPU. The X100e shipped with Radeon HD 3200 graphics, which, while technically being an integrated video chip, offered much better performance than the iGPUs built into Intel's processors at the time. This model was in fact the first ThinkPad to offer an AMD CPU, so while it didn't seem like the pairing got off to a very good start when it came to raw performance, at least it brought along decent graphics for the time. And that's where I think this machine might also find some interest today. Other than as a glorified typewriter, it may, if you set your expectations appropriately, be a compact and inexpensive way to get into retro gaming. It won't play AAA titles from the height of the Windows XP era, but it seems to be reasonably capable when it comes to games from the late 90s. And there's no crazy hacking involved to get XP running on this thing either. Even though it shipped with Windows 7, Lenovo officially supported OSs from XP all the way up to Windows 10, and still offers the drivers for download. Reviews of the X100e generally mirrored my own experience. It has solid build quality and much better features than what its netbook competitors offered. Basically, it was a tiny and inexpensive ThinkPad. Prices started at $450 US and went upward, depending on configuration. But as we saw, performance wasn't that great and it ran pretty hot. I saw temperatures on the side exhaust of 113 degrees Fahrenheit or 45 Celsius. Lenovo tried to fix this by offering a later revision of the model with a dual-core Athlon Neo X2, but this only improved things somewhat. Ultimately, if you wanted a compact ThinkPad that performed well, you needed to look at the X200 series at double the price. Battery life in the X100e was apparently pretty poor too, coming in at less than 5 hours. 
but I couldn't test this for myself as the pack in my machine was completely dead. Even after leaving it to charge for a week, it still showed 0%. So if you're in the market for a small laptop that can play Windows 98, ME, or early XP games without a lot of hassle, the ThinkPad X100e might be worth considering. And likewise, if upgraded appropriately, it could be suitable for use as a minimal distraction writing computer. If you plan to leave the house with it though, you might want to find one with a battery that still works. If you liked the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. Please consider supporting my work over on Patreon. And as always, thanks for watching.